Today's story includes some of the most dramatic police footage I've ever seen in my life. So if you're on the fence about watching today's upload, I would encourage you to stick around just for that. But before we get into today's story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do and we upload once or twice every week. So if that's of interest to you, please draw a gun on the like button and force them to retie your untied shoelaces right after you've stomped around inside of a bathroom of an outdoor museum. Music festival. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's story. In 2015, 29-year-old Johnny Coxie and his wife, 25-year-old Megan Coxie, were living in a low-income section of Spartanburg, South Carolina. They both struggled mightily with drug addiction to the point where it was nearly impossible to get steady work, and so they often found themselves out on the streets begging for money. Their addictions also made it nearly impossible to be a good parent to their only child. And in fact, in December of that year, Child Protective Services stepped in and took their child away from them. And if that wasn't bad enough, almost immediately after their child was taken from them, both Megan and Johnny were arrested and thrown in jail for various offenses that were connected to their drug habits. So Johnny and Megan are at absolute rock bottom at this point as they're sitting in jail, but they were about to get a big break. After they both got out of jail, they were only in jail for a couple of days, Megan was contacted by a local, very successful real estate agent named Todd Kolhep. Todd was someone she had met previously when she used to be a waitress at a local diner, and Todd was reaching out to her to somewhat unbelievably offer her and her husband pretty decent paying jobs. Apparently, Todd had recently purchased this massive 95-acre plot of land in the area, and he needed people to come onto the property and help clean it up and clear brush and clean some of the buildings that are on there because his plan was to further develop this property. And so he had been reaching out to other people in Spartanburg to see if they were interested and Megan and her husband were two people he had contacted. And so of course Megan and Johnny say yes we would love to do this job. They were in desperate need of cash and paying jobs did not come around very often. So on December 19th of that year Megan spoke to her mother and told her about this job opportunity and where it was and what she'd be doing and then she she and Johnny made their way out to this property, and when they got there, they saw this huge chain-link fence wrapped around what seemed like a massive forest, and this forest was the 95-acre plot of land that Todd owned. And so apparently, at the center of this forest were a few buildings that Johnny and Megan would be responsible for cleaning. And so they made their way down the fence line until they found the break in the fence, and that led to an access road, and they began driving down it deep into the heart of this forest. Three days later, Megan's mother tried to get in touch with her, but she couldn't. And when she reached out to Johnny, she couldn't get in touch with him either. And so given the couple's history with drugs, Megan's mother thought the worst, that, you know, maybe they overdosed. And so she panics and she rushes to Megan and Johnny's house. They're not there. And so something in her gut tells her that something is wrong here. It's not common for them to just completely go off the grid. And so she called the police. The police began their investigation by speaking to Todd Kolhap, who was the owner of this property because presumably he was one of the last people to see them before they went missing. But when they spoke to Todd, he said, look, you know, I had limited interaction with them. They were on my property. They came out, they cleaned these two buildings on my property, and then I paid them and they left. And we haven't had any contact since. So, you know, unfortunately, I don't have a clue where they would have gone next. And so at this point, the police decide their best bet is just to wait and see what happens. Although they did not tell Johnny or Megan's families this, the police force did have a running suspicion that, you know, it was possible, if not likely, that the couple had used the money from cleaning up this property to go buy drugs, and then they went on a drug binge, and they would either turn up in a couple of days alive or dead from an overdose. But a couple of days went by, and the couple did not reemerge, and no one had any idea where they were. And then a couple of weeks went by, and then a couple of months went by, and it wasn't long before the case went cold. But it would not stay cold for very long. 
On August 31st, 2016, so roughly eight months after the Coxies were reported missing, two more residents of Spartanburg went missing as well. They were 30-year-old Kayla Brown and her boyfriend, 32-year-old Charlie Carver. The pair had only been dating for about a month, but they were becoming quite serious, with Charlie already introducing Kayla to his family, a step that Charlie's father said was a very big deal for him. Unlike the Coxies, Kayla and Charlie were not struggling with drug addiction or with financial issues, they were actually pretty well off. Charlie worked full-time operating a printer at a local business, and Kayla made a living by doing odd jobs around town. According to their families, it seemed like the couple was very happy with their lives and the directions they were going. But starting on the evening of August 31st, Kayla and Charlie stopped returning text messages or answering phone calls. Charlie's father was especially close with Charlie, and so this sudden silence was immediately noticed by him, but he kind of ruled it out and thought, you know what, I'm sure there's a reasonable explanation for why he's not texting me back, and so, you know, I'll hear from him over the next couple of days. But over the next couple of days, Charlie continued not to answer text messages or pick up phone calls, same with Kayla, and so after 48 hours of this total silence, Charlie's father finally hopped in his car and drove to his son's house to see if he was there and he wasn't and then he drove to Kayla's place and she wasn't there either and so none of it made any sense and so he called the police and he reported them missing the police started with absolutely no leads and so what they did to begin their investigation was basically just to interview everybody in Charlie and Kayla's life friends family acquaintances employers co-workers everyone but no one had any idea where this couple had gone to they had not told anyone about some trip they were going on or something they were going to do. It just seemed like they had vanished. And so initially, this investigation really got nowhere. But two months after they had been reported missing, the police finally obtained a search warrant that would allow them to look at their respective cell phone records. And when they looked at Kayla's cell phone records, they were able to triangulate roughly where her last known location was, according to pings her cell phone was sending off to nearby cell phone towers. And they discovered her last known location, at least of her cell phone, was inside of the same 95-acre plot of land that the Coxies had been in before they went missing. And so immediately the police put in for a search warrant to go search this 95 acre property and they sent a team actually out to the property and they actually set up outside of that big fence and just waited for the search warrant to clear. And at the same time another group of police officers went to Todd Kolhep's house which was actually in town about 20 minutes away from this property to talk to him about why in the world Kayla's cell phone would be pinging inside of his property. And so when the police arrive at his front doorstep, Todd is obviously caught off guard by suddenly there being all these police officers. And he does understand very quickly how unbelievably suspicious it looks that now you have potentially two couples that have gone onto his property right before they vanished. And so he says to them, look, I know how this looks, but I got to tell you, I did hire Kayla and her boyfriend did come along with her. She went onto my property. She did some work for me. She cleaned up some stuff, cleared some brush, and then I paid them and then they left. That is the last I saw of them. I have no idea why her phone would be on my property. At the same time, the team of police officers were kind of grilling Todd at his house. The other team that was outside of the 95 acre property, they found out their search warrant had been granted. And so they flew through the gate, they got on that access road, and they began bombing into this huge forest. And as they're driving, they pull out their map they had printed out that showed the rough estimation of where her final location was within this property and it looked like the last spot was inside of a clearing. And so as they're driving down this access road through all these trees they see up ahead there is a clearing and it looks very much like the clearing on their map where this final location is and when they pull into the clearing off to the left side of the road are these two green buildings. The left building was like a shed like something you might keep yard tools in like lawnmowers and shovels and rakes that kind of thing. And then right next to it on the right was this metal shipping container and it had all these metal chains and five padlocks keeping it shut. Now, of course, the police are thinking, oh my goodness, is Kayla inside one of these buildings? Because this is probably where her last location was. And so right away, the police went inside of the left building, the shack, because it was easier to get into. There weren't padlocks all over it. And when they got inside, there really was nothing of note. Kayla was not in there. Charlie was not in there. There was no cell phone in there 
it was just gardening tools. And so they went over to the right building, the shipping container, and they got out their metal cutting saws and their bolt cutters, and they began cutting into all of these locks and chains. And when they finally got that door open, they were absolutely astounded at what they saw inside. Watch out, y'all move. I got it. Watch out. Hey, Joey. Joey. Cheers, Cheers, Cheers. 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 This is, this, bolt cutters. this is our best He's a paramedic. Oh, yeah. Okay, we're going to get you out of there, okay? Just hang loose for me. Anybody got a, I need a handcuff key. The police had just discovered Kayla. She was in rough shape, and she had a metal chain wrapped around her neck that was anchored to the wall, and she was handcuffed, but she was alive. And after they cut her free and got her out of the shipping container, she told them what happened. She said back on August 31st, 2016, so this was the same day that Charlie's father had realized his son was not responding to his text messages, and when he was calling Kayla, she wasn't answering either. So on that day, Kayla says she was contacted by a friend of hers, Todd Colehab, and he told her that he was still looking for people to come out and help clean up the property because he was getting ready to develop it. And so Kayla, she was looking for work, and so she agreed to do it. And after getting this job, Kayla would tell Charlie, and Charlie, just being a good boyfriend, said, you know what, I'll tag along with you, and I'll help you do this job. I won't ask Todd for any money. I'm just going to go and help you. And so Kayla was totally thrilled about this. And so later that day, she and Charlie, they made their way out to the 95-acre property. They reached that fence that kind of borders the entire property. They followed it until they hit that break in the fence. They hopped on the access road and they began driving into the heart of this very thick forest. And after driving for several minutes, they reach this clearing. And in this clearing, they see Todd up ahead on the left. He's smiling and waving at them. And he's standing in front of the shack and the metal shipping container. And so Charlie pulls the car in right in front of Todd. And then Charlie and Kayla, they get out. They walk up to Todd to, you know, see what he needs, see what he wants them to do. And as soon as the couple is standing standing in front of Todd, Todd just casually pulls out a gun and shoots Charlie three times in the chest. And as soon as Charlie falls to the ground, Todd aims the gun at Kayla and says, if you go anywhere, I will kill you and I will kill your family. And then he put the gun away, walked over to Charlie, and he wrapped him up in a blue tarp, and then he carried his lifeless body and dumped him in the nearby bucket of a tractor. And then Todd just walked back over to Kayla, who's witnessed this entire thing. She is so terrified she can't even move, and she's just staring at Todd. And Todd draws his gun again at her and orders her to go into the shipping container. So he brings her inside, he locks her up, and for 65 days, she would remain his prisoner. And over the course of those 65 days, Todd would once or twice a day come down and do whatever he wanted with her. And he told her at the outset that if she ever tried to resist him in any way and didn't do whatever he wanted with her, he would not only kill her, he would also kill her family. And so Kayla very early on decided she would not put up a fight. She just kind of accepted that this was her life, that she would be horribly mistreated, and then probably at some point he would grow tired of her and kill her but at least she would be sparing her family. And so when the police finally went into that shipping container, Kayla truly did not expect ever to be rescued. So when you watch that video, you need to understand that was someone who believed she was 100% going to die inside of that space. And so after Kayla tells the police officers this totally horrible and traumatic story, they immediately radio over to the other team of police officers that were still at Todd Kolhep's residence, still talking to him and they tell them, hey, this is what Kayla just told us. Todd's reaction to this news was also captured on video. We have Kayla. Excuse me. We have Kayla in your property. She was locked in a container. Okay. She has told us that you shot and killed Charlie. Why did you shoot him? I didn't shoot anybody, sir. 
Okay, why did you lock her in a container in your property? I was talking. She's on your property right now, locked in a container. She's saying you buried Charlie's body on that property. So you're saying you didn't lock her up, you didn't put her in the context box or anything? Uh, probably a good thing. Go ahead and put him in the back of your car. Even though Todd would initially deny any wrongdoing and would claim he had nothing to do with what happened to Kayla or Charlie, he would eventually confess not only to killing Charlie and kidnapping Kayla, but also to killing Johnny and Megan Coxie. Apparently, he had done to them what he did to Kayla and Charlie. He had lured the Coxies onto his property on the promise of work, and then when they reached those two structures, he drew a gun and he shot Johnny and killed him, and then he ordered Megan to go inside of the shipping container. Now, unlike Kayla, who would ultimately comply and it did save her life, Megan did not. She fought back. She was totally resistant. She wouldn't do anything that he wanted her to do. And so after only five days of her being in captivity, he would kill her. And the way he would describe her was, oh, you know, she was acting like a wild animal, so I had to put a bullet in the back of her head. He didn't care at all about these people he had killed. Charlie, Johnny, and Megan's bodies would all be discovered in shallow graves right outside of that shipping container. Knowing he was potentially facing the death penalty and wanting to avoid that, Todd told police after he had confessed to these murders that he could actually confess to even more murders, and if he did, could they take the death penalty off the table? And so the police ultimately would agree, and Todd would tell them that back in 2003, he had walked into a motorbike shop and killed four of their staff members. Apparently, a couple of days earlier, they had offended him in some way. He had gone in there, and they had kind of made some snide remark about how he was bad at riding motorcycles. It was kind of in good fun. It was not meant to be very mean, but Todd had taken it as an absolute offense, and he could not stand for it. And so literally, in broad daylight, he had walked back in into the store and gunned all of them down. And then once they were all down, he had walked by each of them and put an additional round into each of their heads. And so as Todd is telling the police this terrible story, he's totally nonchalant about it. He's laughing about it. And he's even bragging to police that they would be proud of him at how quickly he cleared the superbike shop, meaning how quickly he got in there and killed everyone inside. That somehow, because police officers use weapons too, they would appreciate how efficient he was. These four murders would be the only additional murders Todd would confess to, and they would be enough to take the death penalty off the table. But it's believed Todd had killed more people. In fact, he had blatantly admitted to Kayla when she was in captivity that his body count was in the high two digits. And most likely he was telling her this because he planned on killing her before she could ever escape and tell anyone. But of course, she was rescued, and so the world now knows. However, if Todd never confesses to any more murders, there's a very good chance we'll never know about them. One of the more disturbing aspects of this case is after it became public that Todd Kolhep was the killer, someone discovered that an anonymous account was doing all these product reviews on Amazon, and this anonymous account was Todd Kolhep. And the products he was reviewing were things like knives and shovels and chainsaws. And the reviews literally were about how he planned on using these tools to kill people, or they were how he had used these tools to kill people, or how he had disposed of bodies. And then there was also a couple of reviews of padlocks. And one of the reviews said he had five of them on a shipping container. And so now the shipping container was just like Hotel California. Hotel California is the famous song by the band The Eagles. Eagles, and in this song, the famous line is, you can check out anytime you like, but you can never leave. Todd was ultimately sentenced to seven consecutive life sentences, which means he'll spend the rest of his life in prison. So that's going to do it, guys. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, please draw a gun on the like button and force them to retie your untied shoelaces right after you've stomped around inside of the bathroom of an outdoor music festival. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly one or two video uploads. We are now selling merchandise like flannel,
nails and hats and hoodies and all sorts of stuff. If you're interested, go to shopmrballen.com. If you want to see upcoming deals and promotions for our shop, go to our shop's Instagram page. The username is shopmrballen. If you want to get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter. My username for both platforms is the same. It's just Mr. Ballen. I also have a ton of content over on TikTok where my username is also Mr. Ballen. We have a second YouTube channel just called Mr. Ballen Shorts where we post random short videos and lost episodes. We also have a Facebook page just called Mr. Ballen where we post condensed versions of the longer episodes you see on YouTube. If you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballen. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, Facebook, or some combination, just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, that's going to do it. See ya.